Your uh, bio line that your publicist sent me was so short, I Wikipedia'd you, and uh, and I have to read this paragraph because it's so interesting. This is an early uh, earlier p- piece of your research uh, that you've studied the behavior of philosophers, particularly ethicists, using empirical methods. It's like what? The articles he's published investigate whether ethicists behave more ethically than other populations. Well, you would think so. That's what they do for a living. In a 2009 study, you here investigated the rate at which ethics books were missing from academic libraries compared to similar philosophy books. What does that you mean? If they were stolen? (laughs) Yeah. Well, stolen or (laughs) Or at least one year overdue. I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which is comes close to being stolen. I mean, will, will that, will that book ever come it. back if it's five years overdue? You know, <laughs> right. You know, when I was in graduate school, um, I, I took a course in ethology, animal behavior in 1977 from Meg White. And she lent me a copy of uh, Eibel Ibisfeld's great book on ethology. Yeah. And I never returned it. And I just saw her last year at a memorial service for one of our colleagues, Doug Maverick. And I brought the book back and she said, oh, shucks, at this point, I'll just sign it over to you. <laughs> and it's like, all right, yeah. I should have I should have done this a long time ago. But continuing, the study found that ethics books were in fact missing at higher rates than comparable texts in other disciplines. Subsequent research has measured the behavior of ethicists at conferences, the perceptions of other philosophers about ethicists, and self-reported behavior of ethicists. Your research did not find that any ethical behavior of ethicists differed from the behavior of professors in other disciplines. So what were you after there? Is uh, is it the idea that if you're steeped in moral philosophy, you're going to start thinking about the principles and applying them to your personal life more or not? That's (laughs) kind of what you would think, (laughs) right? It It was driven partly by that natural thought, which is certainly prominent in ancient traditions in philosophy. You know, I study ancient Chinese philosophy, among other things, and seems a natural thought. It was your first reaction was that ethicists would behave better because they think about ethics. It's more salient to them and then maybe apply their discoveries to their lives. But at the same time, in my everyday experience interacting with ethicists, they seem kind of like ordinary professors. They don't seem especially morally good or really especially morally bad. So I thought it'd be worth just trying to figure out which is the case. No one had ever studied it systematically before. Yeah. Interesting. And so essentially there's no difference. They weren't no difference. I mean, the most cited study is the ethics book study where the ethics books seem to be more likely to be missing. Um, But over the course of these studies, and we did, I think, 17 different main dependent measures and a bunch of sub-measures, overall, no difference. Virtually no effects uh, that we could detect statistically using moderately large sample sizes. Yeah. Interesting. I asked because, um, you know, one of my fields of research is on uh, religion. You know, I'm an atheist. Okay, so can you be good without God? Of course you can. Yeah, <laughs> but of course, religious people say, "Well, y- you know, look, being raising children in the doctrines of any holy book, really, just a set of rules, guidelines, a reminder every week, don't forget to be a good person, and so on and so forth, is really needed." Uh, th- th- this is their argument. So the question is, is that true? You know, do do people need to be reminded every week or so? This is why you <laughs> go to religious services. Don't forget to pray for so-and-so and donate to the charity this week and show up at the potluck and help everybody, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, maybe so. But if you're an atheist and you raise a kid in a secular home, what, you're going to teach him Spinoza every week? Or, or you, know, something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is a literal, there is a literature on this about whether re- how well religiosity correlates with moral behavior or behavior according to the precepts of the religion. And I find the that literature a little difficult to interpret. It. Hmm. So you'll so- find some studies that show no difference between religious people and non-religious people. You'll find some studies that show small positive associations between religiosity and the precepts of the religion, but often there are methodological worries, like, you know, when people are talking about their Christianity, they might be at the same time less likely to self-report irreligious 
immoral behavior once you've made you know their religious commitments salient to them and a lot of these studies are funded by or run by people who are highly religious or belong to religious universities who are probably going to be inclined to publish positive results and maybe not publish negative results and might do the statistics in a certain way so i think the evidence is not at all clear I, mean, yeah. I think if you look at the average study in this area, you'll find a little bit of a positive effect. But I, I think it's possible that, that any positive effect there is really due to the kind of systematic problems in social psychological studies that lead to the over, posit, over a publication of positive results. Yeah, there was that uh, research published by um, was it, uh, at the New York Times, the columnist Brooks, right? Uh, I forget his first name now, sorry. David uh, Brooks, yeah. David Brooks, yeah. You know, that religious people give more money, they donate more blood, they donate more hours, volunteer more there hours. There is well. evidence they donate more money, but, you know, the part of the issue there is you measure donation through, say, tax receipts, and there's some good evidence based on tax receipts, tax receipts, right. But another way of thinking about it is if you belong to a religious organization, your club membership dues are tax deductible. <laughs> and if you don't belong to a religious organization, except maybe the skeptic society, right? Your tax to do your, your membership dues are not deductible. Right. So there's, there's, there's something a little bit, I think at least worth pausing over, you know, in looking at donation and tax receipts as a measure of charitable giving when that's conflated with basically contributing to a social group that you, to which you belong. Yeah. I was just this morning tweeting about um, this guy, uh, uh, let's see, Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic League, who posted this article about the nuns, the, the people with no religious affiliation. Now, they're not necessarily atheists and, and agnostics or whatever skeptics. They, they may just be, you know, followers of Deepak Chopra and New Agers or whatever. They just don't yeah. affiliate with any particular religion. And he was griping that they believe a lot of weird stuff. Like you can find spirituality in the mountains. How, you know, this kind of new age, you know, hokum stuff. It's like, yeah, well you eat crackers and drink wine and pretend it's the body and blood of Christ. Like, I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but then I cited, yeah. um, Gregory Paul study, uh, uh, on a, a cross national study comparing the you know, religiosity of countries, 17 different Western developed countries, and a whole bunch of different measures, homicide rates, suicide rates, STD rates, abortion rates, divorce rates, longevity, uh, uh, childhood um, illnesses, and, you know, on and on. And, uh, you know, by far and away, the United States does pretty bad on these measures. We are by far away the most religious, basically comparing all these other Northern European countries and Australia and New Zealand and so on. And we do pretty bad. There now, are also state-by-state state uh, state studies within the United States where some of the states with higher levels of religiosity also have higher levels of divorce and pornography use and yeah. murder and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, these are all confounded in so many ways. You can't, the unfortunate or maybe fortunate thing is you can't randomly assign people to <laughs> religions, right? So it's very hard to study scientifically. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, right. I, I always had that proviso. I'm not claiming that religion causes these problems, you know, homicides or drug use or abortions all have different causal vectors there, but if it's so good for society, how come it's not, you know, a prophylactic against these kinds of social ills? That's the question. You know, there, and there is, there are plausible psychological me mechanisms. I'm not saying this is true, but just to consider there are plausible psychological mechanisms that might lead you to think religiosity would lead, would lead to worse moral behavior, mm. uh, in specific, um, moral cleansing and moral licensing. Right. So, there's some evidence that after you do a good thing, you're a little more likely to do a bad thing afterwards. Mm. Right? We kind of calibrate our morality towards some kind of medium or mediocrity. Uh, so if you perceive going to church as a good thing, right, then that could be a grounds for licensing worse behavior. Ah, well... I did my oh. good thing for the week, so to speak. Oh, like a <laughs> right? like a regression to the mean. <laughs> a regression to the mean in your moral behavior, right? If I've you been conceptualize extra good this week, so next week. <laughs> if you conceptualize participating in your religion as a morally good thing, and people tend to cancel morally good things by letting them cutting themselves a little slack on other things, then you 
That would be one mechanism by which religiosity might lead to worse behavior. Another mechanism would be moral cleansing, right? So, you know, especially in the Catholic religion, there's this forgiveness, right? So the idea that you could do something bad and then be forgiven for it and now not feel as bad about it, maybe, <laughs> right? Um, whereas, you know, that might, to some extent, reduce the motivation to stop doing bad things. Now, I'm not saying this is true. Mm. I'm just saying that, you know, on the one side, you can say, well, of course, there would be plausible mechanisms for thinking religiosity would lead to better behavior because the doctrines say so, and you get reminded all the time, right? But there are the other, other plausible mechanisms on the other side, and the empirical evidence is pretty mixed and noisy. Yeah, it's like the, um, uh, it's like when the, the, the cop car is parked on the side of the road, but there's nobody in it. It's just that presence yeah. of somebody may be watching. <laughs> yeah. And that may, you know, that may lead to people to act better. That's one theory about might. religion. But, you know, as Paul Bloom points out in his book Against Empathy, you know, anything that drives people to be more empathetic with their in-group makes them even less empathetic with out-group members. Yeah, that's another possible mechanism here. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I do try to give credit where credit's due. You know, religion has done a lot of good. Okay. You know, I don't want to just throw it all out. And, you know, even just thinking about like the self-help movement, um, you know, why is it that people that buy self-help books need to continue to buy them? You know, you go to the Tony Robbins seminar and you go like once a year or whatever. And one answer is, appears to be that people need to be reminded you know, don't forget to set goals and don't forget to make yes. your bed every day and don't forget to work out and you got to have, you know, write it down and do these things because, you know, we're, we're lazy or we procrastinate or, you know, we have inner demons along with better angels. So maybe religion has kind of accidentally developed a self-help technology of getting people to act better. You know, so we know what men are like <laughs> when they're not married versus when they're married. <laughs> For the most part, it's good. It's good to be married. It's good to have a commitment. Uh, you know, good to be reminded of these things. And, you know, there's those studies where testosterone in men goes down when they get married and have a kid, you know, and they're less likely to, you know, have thoughts about philandering or whatever. Just, you know, those kinds of things. So maybe religion, you know, meeting once a week is about the right amount of reminder. Don't forget to be a good person next week. <laughs> it certainly could be. I'm not anti-religious. Uh, we're members of a Jewish temple here in Riverside. So, um, you know, <laughs> and we have our charitable contributions that we give to that temple, of course. <laughs> so, um, yeah, not anti-religion, but I do think it's just so psychologically complex. And it's not, I mean, and it's parallel to this issue about ethics professors. You know, what is the relationship between kind of thinking about and espousing ethical issue, uh, ethical norms and actually putting them into practice in your life? It looks like the relationship is much looser than you might have thought. Well, what, I, I'll just mention one other anecdotal thing yeah. on this, right? Whenever I meet a clergy person, one of the first things I do is I ask them whether they think that clergy, on average, be, behave better than the lay people of their religion. Hmm. I've never had a clergy member answer yes to that question. Really? Now, it could be they're being modest on behalf of their profession, I think. Yeah. You know, it would be a little weird to say, oh, yes, we clergy are better, <laughs> right? But at the same time, it kind of feels sincere. And I've had some clergy say, like, Oh, we're way worse. <laughs> like seemingly very <laughs> sincere. Uh, you know, so so that's a kind of I would love to study that more empirically, like I've done with ethics professors, study the moral behavior of clergy members. You know, of course, all the, there are all these scandals, you know, in, among clergy that people know about, right? But we haven't I don't think there's been a lot of systematic study of mm -hmm. of the moral behavior of clergy. I think that would be really interesting. Remember uh, Francis Galton, one of his earliest correlational studies in the late 19th century was do religious people live longer because they, they get prayed for or they pray for or whatever. And, and the answer was no, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> so it'd be Cult along the lines so of your... <laughs> fascinating and cool and terrible in certain ways and wonderful in others. I didn't know about that study of yeah. his. Yeah. yeah Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Interesting. And also uh, then related to Aristotle's virtue ethics. Now I'm not a philosopher. So you tell me if I get this right. Acting virtuous, just just act it. You will actually become more virtuous. You actually feel it because it. You can't just pretend to be a good person. You gotta actually really live it, and then and then yeah. you actually become more religious or more virtuous. And maybe religion does something along those lines as well, or secularists could. Right, you can learn by doing, and it's certainly true that Aristotle thought that you know the habits of good behavior, as they get more deeply ingrained with you, become part of the personality that you carry forward. So it's, 
And the Stoics thought similar things, and the Confucians thought similar things, and Buddhists think similar things. I think there's a among kind of worldviews that have a substantial focus on moral behavior. A lot of them, maybe the maybe most of them, value the importance of acting repetitively <laughs> over and over again in good ways. Uh, that brings you brings that action to become more natural, more habitual, and reflect more of the worldview, as opposed to a kind of a purely intellectualist picture where you just kind of like, once you have the insight, you've discovered it, and now you're gonna, in a behavior is automatic, right? It's, it's often not automatic. It requires living and doing and applying before it, it really settles into your, uh, into your soul, so to speak. Oh, yeah, that reminds me of Joshua Green's MRI, fMRI studies of subjects uh, undergoing the trolley problem. Yeah. You know, would, yeah, would you flip the switch versus would you throw somebody off the bridge? The flipping the switch is more of an intellectual exercise, but the, you know, physically grabbing somebody and heaving them off a bridge feels more viscerally uh, immoral, and, and therefore they had different responses, even though the outcome, you know, kill the one to save the five is the same. Right. Yeah, this is a very famous study and very famous thought experiment, right? So um, if you ask people, would you flip a switch you know, if there's a runaway trolley and it's going to kill five people if you do nothing, would you flip a switch to divert it on a sidetrack where they kill one person? People will tend to say yes, right? If you say, oh, well, would you push a hiker with a heavy backpack off a bridge into the path of the trolley so the trolley grinds to a halt on his dying body? <laughs> And then saves the five. People are tend to be like, no, I wouldn't push the guy. But it seems like the same thing, ultimately. I mean, the consequences are basically the same. One person dies in order to save five. You've kind of killed one person to save five. Right? But people, they're more emotionally engaged. Um, areas in their brain, emotional centers in their brain, seem to be more active when they consider the, the, the bridge case than when they consider the sidecar case. Uh, people are slower to say yes i would push the guy <laughs> those who do say yes they would push the guy tend to be slower and it seems to involve kind of more cognitive frontal processing yeah so josh green has done a, a lot of interesting work on this yeah i was thinking about that the other night i was watching the documentary film based on uh, christopher browning's book ordinary men about the uh, that police battalion oh, a great book uh, yeah as part of the einsatzgruppen that was sweeping eastward after the vermont uh, defeated the russians and then killed all the Jews in all the little towns. And, yeah. you know, these were truly ordinary men. They were, by, by, by that great title. But yeah. and, and then some of them, uh, you know, were not comfortable doing it, and they were allowed to back out, but a lot of them um, went through with it and then got shit-faced and, you know, were not uh, comfortable doing it. It was terrible. Some of them did, though, get into it. You know, after a while, maybe yeah. they got used to it. It was hard to say. Maybe it was just natural human variation and how Almost you respond Almost all to of it. the men did it. Yeah. Yeah. I actually teach this. I teach a giant lower oh, division class called Evil. Oh, nice. And we teach about the history of police, police battalion 101. And I draw on Browning and on Goldhagen. Um, and yeah, so it's about 500 men. And they were sent to Poland, mostly without much training. These men were, their average age was over 30. So these were not impressionable young recruits. They're draftees. They had not volunteered to be in the army. Only a minority of them belonged to the Nazi party. They were told, go to this village, kill these thousands of innocent Jews. I mean, they weren't described as innocent. <laughs> yeah. These Jewish women and children and men and older people. Um, and their commander said, hey, look, if you don't feel up to this, that's okay. You can volunteer for other duties. And of the 500 men, there was only one who consistently declined to do it. What happened to him? He transferred back to Hamburg and was promoted. <laughs> <laughs> there was at one point there was a call for people to transfer not to the front line but to a radio communication unit and according to the records that currently exist only two of the men applied for that transfer so they didn't seem to be finding their job horrible hmm. but they did drink a lot right was it their uh, stories about yes. this yeah they did do, they did do a lot of alcohol consumption right and they complained about the difficulty of their task but they didn't seem to back out of it despite being given opportunities to do so. 
without if I recall, huge um, personal H- cost. Himmler went to see one of these mass grave shootings and yeah. got sick to his stomach. And this in part led to the more mechanization of extermination using gas chambers rather than bullets. Right. Himmler was very concerned about the moral psychology of his men. He thought that having these men doing face-to-face killing would turn the men into monsters. Mm. And he wanted, he was very solicitous of the mental health of his men. <laughs> he was not, of course, at all concerned about the mental health of Jews. But yeah, so that's kind of ironic, isn't it? <laughs> right, Eichmann did the same thing. He went to the, he went to the front, he saw this in person, and he was mortified, horrified, didn't want to look at it. Yeah. Have you ever seen the, uh, uh, there's a nice YouTube video of the Posnan speech that Himmler gives uh, to his underlings uh, about about this problem and about other problems too. It's like, well, people are stealing and abusing the corpses and, you know, we have to yeah. stop that. All the loot's got to go to the to the Reich and so on. But but also, uh, you know, everybody has their favorite Jew. Like, oh, I you know, I want to kill the Jews. But, you know, th- this one's my friend and everybody's got a, a favorite one and we have to get over this. We have to remember what we're doing here. He's like a pep yeah. talk. He's like Tony Robbins. Come on, you can do this. <laughs> right. It's really something to, to it's listen really, to. It's really, I, I just find that so fascinating, right? I have a whole, as I said, I have a whole class about these kinds of issues. Another issue that we talk about in that class, which I think is some has some interesting similarities, but also some differences, is a lynching in the American South in mm. the early 20th century, where ordinary white people would mm. treat these lynching events as celebratory occasions they would bring their family they'd have picnics oh unbelievable those pictures where they're all dressed up with their hats and it's like sunday go to meeting exactly (laughs) and then there's this corpse of this person who's just been killed often not even accused of a serious crime um and they just and they smile for the picture with the corpse right and it's just like what is going on in their minds and how do ordinary people Managed to be yeah. so unperturbed by this. What is your answer to that? Well, the reason I teach the class is that I'm still trying to figure out the answer. Yeah, yeah. well, me too. <laughs> I write about this a lot too. So you mentioned, okay, let's, let's talk about uh, Daniel Goldhagen, Hitler's yeah. Willing Executioners. You know, this was yeah. a kind of controversial book in, in a way. I mean, to what extent were uh, the other uh, people in other countries willing to go along with this? And maybe there's just great variation. Some did, some didn't. You know, maybe anti-Semitism was fairly rampant. But was it exterminationist anti-Semitism? Did it go that far? Uh, you know, uh, um, right. I talk about Hugo Mercier's book, Not Born Yesterday. He has a chapter on the Nazis in which he, he argues that while anti-Semitism was rampant, it wasn't exterminationist anti-Semitism. And most of the right. German people would not have wanted to gone that far. But by the time you get to the Vansi Conference, it's too late. No one can do anything about it because... You just get shipped off to a concentration camp yourself if you try to resist. Right. Yeah, I'm inclined to think Goldhagen has some advantages and disadvantages over Browning, but I think one of the things that he's been criticized, in my opinion, rightly for, is overplaying the extent to which there was exterminationist anti-Semitism that people really wanted to see Jews killed, as opposed to being kind of Willing. I mean, I like the title. Willing to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Not wanting to do it. I think there's a big difference, mm. right? Yeah, for sure. And uh, also Eichmann and, and Hannah Arant's, you know, phrase about the banality of evil. But, yeah. you know, she's been criticized by Eichmann's biographers saying, he, you know, yeah. he, he wasn't just some paper-pushing bureaucrat. He was into it. I mean, he, he was really, what was the phrase? An alpinist of evil. <laughs> yeah, you know, like uh Batena Stagnet. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. So right. yeah, yeah, I think uh Arendt's book, which I also teach in that class, is really mm-hmm. uh really interesting and it's a nice it's an interesting portrayal of a kind of person. And then there's an, a question whether Eichmann was exactly the kind of person that she's portraying. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but it's still very psychologically plausible what she's saying about the type of person who is willing to kind of basically do evil without thinking too much about the consequences, mortified by the consequences when faced with them, 
but is really much more concerned about their own career and local stuff and, and doesn't prefers just not to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Career advancement. Um, I guess there was no punishment for not going along with it, but, but the motivation to go along with it, it you know, was high. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Did you read uh, Roy Baumeister's book evil about his, uh, I haven't he, read that one. Oh yeah. So he's got some great stuff where he interviews these serial killers in, in prison. This was uh, in, in part testing the hypothesis that these guys are all have low self-esteem. Well, what he found out was they have very high self-esteem. In fact, <laughs> they thought very much of themselves and that it was really a more of a moralization problem that they felt that, you know, to a man that the person they killed really deserved to die. I mean, they had a, he, she had it coming. She cheated on me or he dissed me and he insulted me and, you know, he stole my, whatever it was. Yeah. And, you know, they were the judge, jury, and executioner, and they felt it was absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah, I think Dostoevsky said when he went to prison in Siberia that he, he never counted anyone who thought that they deserved to be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Bob Meister also talks about the moralization gap between being the victim versus the perpetrator. You know, victims always, uh, you know, just focus on the victimization and the horrors of it. And we have to deal with this. And the perpetrator is like, let's just all move on here. This is not that big of a deal. <laughs> I mean, look, it didn't bother me that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting, I was just finishing, um, Maisha Cherry has a new book uh, called Failures of Forgiveness. Mm. Uh, she's a colleague of mine here at UCR. Um, mm. And she has, this book is really interesting on especially our celebration of when that doesn't happen, when the victims forgive, right? And especially uh, she focuses on the black survivors of racist attacks, mm. right? So someone goes into a black church, kills a bunch of people, and then not too long after, the, the parents of the survivors say, I forgive him. And we regard this as a kind of beautiful thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the social psychology of that? What's the moral psychology of that? Can for business, forgiveness be too fast? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit like the restorative justice where, you know, the perpetrator after he's caught meets with the victims, you know, the, 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 the home that was burgled. Here's the guy you, whose home you burgled. Oh, well, this was like the 20th one this month. I don't even remember which one you are. And the, for the guy that got burgled, this is like the worst thing that's ever happened to him. Right? right. So they try to convey that. They get the two of them in a room together, which is really difficult. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have restorative justice, a lot needs to happen on the perpetrator side. Yeah. Right. Those truth and reconciliation uh, commissions. I mean, I, we, we're going to need one of those for probably years to come in the Middle East now. <sighs> What do you make of this? While well, we're on this subject, we'll get to your book in a minute. But what do you make of? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is great. I love talking about this <laughs> yeah, stuff. It has no. almost nothing to do with the weirdness of the world book, but it's like my previous book is all about this, and I've yeah. published a bunch of things on this. Yeah. Oh, it's super interesting and important. You know, but what all these college students protesting against Israel and celebrating Hamas and Palestine and so did they know what they're <sighs> saying? Are, are they just caught up in the moment, chanting from the river to the sea, and they don't even know what the river is? And, you know, are they, are they really, uh, you know, secretly anti-Semitic or not really, they just, they don't really know what they're saying or they would just want to be pro Palestine, but they're not really anti-Israel or do we really have a problem? Yeah, I am. I am not an expert on these particular issues. It's such a quagmire. I, I am inclined to think that most of what's going on with those students is this feeling that correct feeling. I think that Palestine has been badly treated and oppressed by Israel for a long time. And that needs to be recognized. Um, I don't think most of these students, you know, think that what Hamas did on October 7th was a good thing. If, <laughs> I don't I think don't know how so. they could. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, right. And now Israel is killing a lot of Palestinian yeah. civilians. Yeah. You know, and they, I think, want to recognize that that fits into this horrible history. So my view is that it's not primarily driven by anti-Semitism, but rather by the desire to you know, stand up for this this group that has uh, suffered a lot and been pretty oppressed. Yeah. 
I think that's probably it. Uh, also, you know, if young people want to be part of some moral crusade. Uh, they read about the civil yeah. rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the gay rights movement. I, well, I want to do something, okay? Well, what's next? You know, trans rights or BLM or Me Too or now, you know, Palestine. Okay, I want to get out there and, you know, I want to march. <laughs> and, There's and that something can be a good invigorating thing. <laughs> about yeah. being in a moral crusade and with other people who yeah. are, you know, and you all agree and, you know, there there's something that's really attractive in that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, what's weird about the world? <laughs> what do you mean by what do you mean by weird? Let's start there. <laughs> what I mean by weird is contrary to the ordinary expected, readily understood. So I think with respect to fundamental cosmology and consciousness, the world defies our sense of what's ordinary and commonsensical and defies our understanding. I call this the universal bizarreness and the universal dubiety thesis. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> By dubiety, you mean just the dubiousness of it. Dubiousness, right. I could have yeah. called it universal dubiousness, but I don't know. <laughs> dubiety, yeah. I like that a little bit. But uh, yeah, so the idea is when you're talking about fundamental cosmology and when you're talking about how consciousness fits into the material or seemingly material world, Every theory is going to be bizarre in the sense that it's going to violate our common sense understanding of how things work in some respect or other. And every theory is going to be dubious in the sense that we don't have compelling epistemic reason to settle on one theory above all others. Yeah. So from the history of science, so let's think of some examples. If you go from a Newtonian clockwork universe where you have essentially just build billiard balls bouncing off each other to, you know, Einstein comes along and says, no, 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 this is, it's not what's going on here at all. This is completely different than you think it is. That would be an example right. like what, you know, we're used <laughs> to that now. Space time is one thing right. and you know, all this relativity theory. Yeah. Okay. We, you know, we've inculcated right. that, but at the time that must've been weird. Yes, for sure. I think, um, right. So, uh, one particularly interesting historical example, I think, of this is Copernicus, right? So when Copernicus said, the Earth moves around the sun, that was bizarre, radically contrary to common sense. People are like, this planet is the definition of a thing that doesn't move. How could it be circling that thing in the sky that's obviously going around us, right? It's like highly bizarre, right? And also early on, you know, in Copernicus's day and probably at least up to the time of Galileo and Kepler, it was dubious. I mean, it was, it's not like Copernicus really like proved it definitively, right? So uh, heliocentrism was a weird view, right? It was yeah. bizarre and dubious. So, uh, you know, but eventually we came to discover that it's true, or I mean, with relativistic caveats, it's approximately true. And uh, there's no, there's no, no longer strikes us as bizarre. Was it Wittgenstein who said, well, what would it look like otherwise? I mean, if, if it was geocentrism, <laughs> right. it would look exactly like it looks like. <laughs> right, right. Famous quip by Wittgenstein. I think it was yeah. Elizabeth Anscombe maybe said, yeah, well, it looks like the sun goes around the earth. And Wittgenstein says, well, what would it look like if the earth went around the sun? <laughs> 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 yeah. Other examples, I was thinking of the, you know, meteorites, stones falling from the sky. You know, this, this yeah. just seemed ridiculous. Yeah, until pretty right. late in well, eighteenth yeah. mid mid eighteenth century maybe, something like that. And relativity theory, as you start with, is also it's it, um, it's it's still I think still bizarre. I still violates common sense. Common sense is not adjusted to this one yet, right? To think that um, something moving at high velocity, time is going slower than it, than yeah. than for us. <laughs> Except that relative to its perspective, time is going slower for us, right? And there's no apps, you know, that whole just special relativity already is, I mean, it's not really dubious. It's, it's got to be true or something very close to it has to be true, but, um, but it's still pretty bizarre. But the, uh, I think the, the uh, familiar example where I think we still have both weird, we have full weird, weirdness with bizarreness and dubiety that uh, your listeners might be somewhat familiar with is interpretations of quantum mechanics, right? So whether the reason, wh whether 
the world is constantly splitting into myriad mm -hmm. other copies of itself in the many worlds interpretation or whether our observation of events can cause the kind of the collapse of the wave function or whether there's a kind of Bohmian pilot wave that's going, you know, uh, way faster than the speed of light or, you know, all of the interpretations are bizarre and violate common sense. I mean, quantum mechanics clearly violates currently what we regard as common sense. Um, but there's no one really compelling interpretation. I mean, I think people can justifiably prefer some interpretations over others, but I don't think we can say, ah, yeah, it's established. This is the correct interpretation. So that's a good example of how the world is weird, right? It's all the options are bizarre and they're mm -hmm. all dubious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the two slit experiment. Yeah, I just right. keep I, 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 every year or so I reread it again. Like, wait, let me see if I get this straight again. <laughs> like, yeah, this is so weird. How can this be? <laughs> right. Or you know, this idea that we're living in a simulation, or there's multiple universes, and if it's infinite, then yes. you and I are having this very conversation some in some other bubble universe, past or yeah. present. It, it it's inevitable. It will happen. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean. uh yeah, I've got a chapter on this that I uh, co-authored with a physicist and philosopher of phys physics named uh, Jacob Berendes. And um, right, just from ordinary assumptions about physics, basically vanilla cosmology and physics out of the box, it looks like the universe will endure infinitely. And of course, there'll be heat death. That's the standard view anyway. But post-heat death, most of the standard kind of physical models suggests that there will be chance fluctuations of highly organized matter, including as large as a whole galaxy. There's no kind of in principle limit to the size of a chance fluctuation. So there'll be, if we just take these views out of the box, standard vanilla views, there will be in the far, 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 far distant future, spontaneously arising galaxies, which will contain basically whatever, and there'll be infinitely many of them. So eventually there'll be galaxies that are as close as you care to imagine to our current galaxy that arise through chance. Um, and, and, and there'll whatever be copies of you and copies of me yeah. having variants of this conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Whatever would include planets and therefore life forms and so on. Oh yeah. Right. And if, you know, th that's why I just, I don't know, again, it just, I don't feel like infinity can be true. And yet, yeah. You know, there's reasonable arguments that it is. <laughs> and what yeah, do I, I mean, know? it's not compelled. <laughs> I mean, there you could, may, and may the universe might settle into an unfluctuating state. That's not the standard view, but there's some physicists who've argued for that, right? Or time might come to a stop. Mm. Or, you know, there are other possibilities. But what would that even mean? Time comes to a stop. What would it even mean stop, for time right? to come to a stop? But you, you yeah. know what I mean? That's a little bit of a tricky one. <laughs> you know, again, it's like asking, you know, what, what, what was there before time began? It's like, it's just, a meaningless conceptual question it it but, seems like a meaningful question but it also seems like yeah maybe a contradictory question because the word before kind of assumes yeah, time time right yeah, <laughs> yeah you know Kant argues that this is one of the antinomies where our uh our understanding of the world kind of leads into contradiction which he right, uses so to kind here, of show yeah. the limitations of human understanding of fundamental metaphysics Right. So the Mysterian mysteries, you know, that, that they're by nature insoluble, you know, yeah. so let's, let's channel our uh, Rumsfeld's, you know, known knowns and known unknowns. <laughs> and then, you know, are there known unknowables? That is, we have a big enough brain and concepts and language to conceive of these problems, consciousness and infinity and what was there before time or whatever. But, but we're restricted. I guess this would be a Wittgensteinian kind of problem, but just the words we use or the concepts we hold about these things means they can never be solved. You know, maybe there's some weird, the next Einstein comes along two centuries now and goes, no, 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 we're going to completely think about this totally <laughs> differently. Oh, and then you and I come happen. back after we're chronically frozen 500 years from now and go, oh, that's what it was. Oh, of course. Okay, Why I did I not realize? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm inclined to think of it slightly differently than that there are permanent mysteries. So here's just one way of, thinking about this, right? So, or just a starting thought and then a metaphor. So the starting thought is, if you think about our evidence about the Big Bang, it's pretty limited. It's like, we've got 
light coming in, landing in telescopes. And from the current state of light landing on photographic plates, computers, and eyeballs, and telescopes, how in the world could you justify the conclusion about what was happening over 10 billion years ago, the first second of the Big Bang? And yet, mm -hmm. we have pretty good reason to think we know quite a bit about the strangeness of things that happened during the first second of the Big Bang. Right, So from a very limited type of observation base, we've come to a pretty interestingly rich understanding of something that is really pretty far removed from that observation base. So science can sometimes have the power to reveal things that you might not have thought would be within its power to reveal. Yeah. A lot of that, though, comes from just pure rationality and mathematics, right? Like when uh, I had uh, Leonard Milad now on the show, he co-authored a book with Stephen Hawking, The Grand Design, and then he wrote a memoir about working with Hawking. Yeah. And he made references to like, you know, when Stephen discovered, you know, black hole radiation, discovered, you mean, was he like using a telescope or something? No, 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 no. He's just doing math. It's like, right. well, how does you, you know, how does it pop off the page? Oh, there it is right there. You know, the 13th step of the equation. <laughs> amazing. It really yeah. is amazing what, what can be done in that way. I and mean, so for that reason, I'm hesitant to say, oh, this kind of thing is forever beyond science. Yeah. But so the metaphor I prefer instead is one that's falsely attributed to Einstein, hmm. which is that the larger the circle of light, the larger the ring of darkness around it. Hmm. So my inclination is to think science will keep brightening us, but there will always be something behind it, beyond mm -hmm. it that we won't have. It's not like we'll ever have the entire cosmos illuminated for us, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever we discover, and there may be no bound to it, right? There will always be more that is undiscovered. Mm -hmm. Science just... will always have presuppositions and boundaries and limits that we don't, where we don't fully understand what the next step is or what the grounds or cause of this was or, or why it's this way rather than that way. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of have to be a mix of scientists and philosophers. We kind of have to be willing to speculate a bit about, okay, what is in that hazy darkness in that ring beyond the light? I mean, we're not clueless about it. We can speculate. There are better and worse kind of, conjectures about stuff that we don't really know. Um, Here's how and I, that's here, kind of where science and, and yeah. philosophy meet, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here's how I put it. Um, this is in my last chapter of the next book I'm working on, on truth. Think of science as building an expanding sphere of knowledge. As the sphere of the known expands into the ether of the unknown, the proportion of ignorance seems to grow. The more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. But in this mathematical analogy, note what happens when the radius of a sphere increases. The expansion of the surface area is squared, while the increase in the volume is cubed. So as the <laughs> sphere of scientific knowledge expands, the volume of the known increases by a ratio of 3 to 2 over the surface area of the unknown. The more you know, the more of the unknown becomes known. It is at this boundary where we uh, stake a claim of true progress in the history of science. <laughs> Interesting. I really like that. So you're taking this... This analogy that is Literally, falsely yeah. attributed to, to yeah. Einstein. And, and I don't really know who first came up with that. I, uh, with Gould made a reference to something like that, this, this you know, radius of spheres in one of his essays, and I couldn't find it. So yeah, reference yeah that's it, but pretty he probably cool. got it from somebody else. Well, I, I that follows a, a quote from Isaac Asimov that I always like to use. Um, yeah. I called it Asimov's axiom in one of my Scientific oh, American okay. columns where he says, when people thought the Earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the Earth was spherical, they were wrong. It's an oblate spheroid. But if you think that thinking the Earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the Earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He called that the, his essay was the relativity of wrong. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I like that. Well, he's addressing, you know, like these pseudoscientists and paranormalists or whatever. Well, you know, they right. laughed at Galileo, so my crazy idea might, might, must be right. Right. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> Probably yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, that's a great quote. I hadn't heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, right. Um, 
I don't know. One reason I'm interested in this because, you know, I de- debate a lot of theists who, you know, they want to push the causal chain back and then stop it at, at you know who, God. You know, there has right. to be a, a, a prime mover, a first cause, you know the arguments. Yeah. What is your answer to that uh, when they go, well, there has to be a, a, a prime, you know, Aquinas's arguments dressed up in modern physics and cosmology? Yeah. I don't know why there has to be. <laughs> it's, that's me. What's the argument that there has to be? Uh, well, the argument is that effect? everything in motion we see around us was caused by something else that pushed it. Therefore, there has to be a first pusher. That's the argument. Yeah. I mean, I don't really have, like, here's why that argument is but don't wrong, philosophers have but something I about don't know that. why I need to accept yeah. it. Yeah. But maybe this is what you guys call a category error. You know, you're, you're talking about normal stuff around the room here. I'm looking at things yeah. happening, and the universe is not in the same category. It's a different thing. And that's definitely one way that you could, you know, duck that argument. I mean, yeah. I mean, to think that the universe is caused, that's a different kind of claim than to think that, you know, this pencil was caused by previous mm-hmm. things. I, yeah. yeah. You know, and there are exceptions to everything. I mean... To me, what's wrong with just saying uh, nobody knows at the moment uh, the origins of the universe? I mean, right. there's... You know, as you mentioned, it's half a dozen different theories about this. Who who knows which one's going to turn out to be right? If we ever know for sure, doesn't maybe there maybe there is no origin of the universe. Maybe there's an origin of the universe that's a not theistic. Maybe there is no origin. Maybe things go infinitely backwards. So that yes, every effect has a cause. Right. Right. And there's yeah. no end to the to, <laughs> right. to the causes. Right. right? Uh, it would still be true that every effect has a cause. Right. If the universe goes or not the universe, but whatever it is. I mean, if we think of our universe as having been caused by some prior state of. I don't know, quantum foam or whatever. Right. Then. You know, that could go back infinitely. Certainly, if it could go forward infinitely, uh, we don't know backwards. You know, we don't know where we are. Yeah. I mean, I I have a, a, a cutesy. I don't think compelling, but cutesy argument for for the infinite backward extension of time. Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, as we're talking about, if you take ordinary physics out of the box, it seems to suggest there will be infinitely many duplicates of us, basically, in the future. Now, there is something puzzling about that in that, like, why would you and I be the first? It seems like kind of a coincidence, right? Like, if you were to draw from an urn of 10 quadrillion balls and you got number ball number one you'd be like (laughs) this is a magic "Hmm, trick (laughs) something's rigged here or i don't think that was really a random draw (laughs) yeah Yeah. so this is called the magician says pick a card any card it's totally random (laughs) you know it isn't (laughs) (laughs) right so you know in philosophy these are called self-location puzzles and there are various puzzles you can create but you know one, if you think it would be puzzling that we are the first copies, so to speak, right? Then one possible explanation for that would be the universe goes infinitely backwards as well as infinitely forward, right? So prior to our Big Bang was some cause. And there are, you know, other duplicates of us somewhere back in that prior history of things. Yeah. Well, there's several... Uh, arguments along these lines of the Copernican principle, we're not special, or the mediocrity right. principle applied to lots of things, like, you know, we're, are we alone in the universe? What are the chances we're the very first communicating intelligent civilization? Seems pretty right. unlikely. Therefore, you end yeah. up with the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? They should be here by now. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Or the the simulation, right? This is, Isn't this Bostrom's argument that uh, the chances that we're the first to create uh, virtual reality is uh, we're more likely to be in the middle of the bell curve. Therefore, somebody should have done this already. Therefore, there's, what is it, greater than 50% Bayesian probability that we are living in a simulation because somebody else got there ahead of us. <laughs> uh, he puts it at about about 33%, not over Oh, 50%. 33%. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he thinks that uh, it's not unreasonable to think think that there would be lots of simulated beings in the universe if we ourselves are on the cusp of creating them. 
then and you kind of accept this idea that we're not special we're not first right then there might be many many civilizations that have already done it and will do it and if you kind of look from an objective perspective on the cosmos maybe maybe most of the beings in the universe are simulated beings now the reasons to doubt that right that's why he doesn't think it's that's why he only assigns 33 credence mm. instead of you know a higher credence but he thinks like look if you think the universe is it conditioned upon the universe having many, many simulated beings. The odds that we would be the lucky ones who aren't simulated are pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I always wonder what to do with these thought experiments. They're fun. They're interesting. It makes for good science fiction plots. But like I had Chalmers on the yeah. podcast, he has a whole book about this. You know, what, what ethics will yeah. be like in the simulated universe, whatever. Super fun and interesting. But he says right on like page one, none of this is testable. We'll never know. Like, well, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> now what? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's testable. You do? How would of. you test it? Yeah. Well, you could take a sign, put it in your backyard, say, hey, player, if this is a simulation, oh. ring a bell in the sky. <laughs> right. Computer. And then see if a bell gets rung. <laughs> the program... Now, if a bell gets rung, that's pretty good evidence that it's a simulation. <laughs> I mean, not decisive evidence <laughs> actually that's yeah that's right. that's that's good something like and since you mentioned star trek's my favorite episode of the next generation was the ship in the bottle uh oh i love that yeah, it, yeah star trek's so great for, for listeners not familiar with that one um you know they go in the holodeck uh, to play one of the sherlock holmes programs and the art you know arch uh, uh enemy uh moriarty appears and and then he he brings his sweetheart into the story and then the two of them exit the uh holodeck and the crew is sitting there going, how did they leave? They can't leave the, how is this possible? You can't leave the holodeck if you're not real. And then, you know, right. then the rest of the episode is trying to figure out how they did this. And then at the very end, there's like a little glitch. I forget what it was. Uh, Data doesn't use, he uses a contraction, or left hand instead of right hand or something like that. And they realize they're still in the holodeck. And, <laughs> and the entire right. enterprise is, you know, a simulation. And then exactly, Barkley, yeah. you know, the, uh, the, the, the kind of quirky uh, officer there, you know, ends it by by looking up to the computer computer and program to see if this whole thing is gonna and the the thing he thinks is actually reality. And that's what you mean. Right. Like you could just say right. a, a computer and program, and all this d disappears. Then where are you? <laughs> right. So I think you could find pretty compelling evidence that this is a simulation. If it is, it might be harder to find compelling argument evidence that it's not. Hmm. But. Yeah. So, but but that, you know, if you keep trying to find evidence for something and you don't find evidence for it, that kind of constitutes an evidence that maybe it doesn't exist. I mean, as a, uh, you know, this is part of the issue with believing in God, right? People keep trying to find evidence for it, <laughs> don't really find positive evidence. Maybe that's part of the reason to think there isn't a God, right? So you you could potentially apply that same kind of reason. Yeah, well, at the very end of the episode, the, the, the there's a little cube sitting on the desktop, and they go, Moriarty and his sweetheart are in there on yes. this voyage. <laughs> but that, but but that does suggest that the simulation has to be running on hardware somewhere. It, no, no matter how how nth generation simulation it is, yeah. somewhere there has to be hardware running it. And if you have too somewhere. many simulations, there's just not enough computer processing to run it. And therefore, you're going to get glitches and buffering or whatever you would see. It depends on how powerful the base level computers are, right? So, you know, if the base level computers on this way of thinking are super duper powerful, way more powerful than anything we can kind of construct on Earth, then maybe there wouldn't be a resource problem. Mm. Um, but, you know, maybe they wouldn't be so powerful. I mean, it's so hard to speculate well about these things. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of what what you meant, mentioned uh, a computer chess in in your chapter on this. I was thinking, yeah, I play my Apple computer uh, chess program a lot, and I've never won, not once. <laughs> yeah. Now, if this was all a simulation, wouldn't I somewhere in there go, okay, this time you get to win, and you know what the right move is? <laughs> but I never know what the right move is, so right, it, it can't be a simulation because I would at some point want to win. It can't be a simulation run by you. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> if yeah. If you're the okay. one running the simulation, <laughs> then you're not going to consistently outsmart yourself. Right? <laughs> okay, that's true. 
<laughs> now, if it's it. if it's a chess genius running the simulation, then I'd be like, ah, oh, I'm gonna fool this dope again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's too funny. It, uh, I don't know if you remember Frank Tipler's book, The Physics of Immortality, back in the 90s. I think it was late 90s. No, I don't think I read that one. I know his, his, you know, earlier stuff with Barrow, but I don't think I know yeah, that one. Yeah, he did the anthropic principle stuff. Um, yeah. uh, but the sequel to that, just by himself, Physics of Immortality, was um, that in the far future, that computer simulations will be so uh, high fidelity that you wouldn't know that you're actually in a simulation. And it, so there's like 20 steps to get to where he wants to get to, which is this Omega point, this far future supercomputer, which is essentially God. And then God will, this, God, this supercomputer will resurrect everyone who ever lived or could have lived because it's a finite number. And the number he came up with was 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 186 binary digits you need to resurrect everybody who ever lived and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and oh, by the way, okay. he's, he's a Christian. So it turns out, you know, the Judeo-Christian God is really close to this omega point computer <laughs> and and that and that Jesus was resurrected through a, a beam of of um of of particles what was a neutrino particles pushing him up to hell. anyway he goes it's just it was just ripe for skeptical analysis in our magazine yeah. but, but i like frank i mean it's it's not a completely crazy idea in terms of a thought experiment of like if you carry out this idea of having a big enough computer that you know that that the that that the replication was such high fidelity you wouldn't know yeah uh, that that seems plausible um and i think you know as we're talking about i think something weird needs to be true there's kind of like no non-weird cosmological possibilities so the fact that something just just that it seems weird isn't enough to rule it out yeah um but yeah, at the same time, there's this tendency for people to get attracted to particular ways of thinking through the weirdness and be, for whatever reason that I can't really understand, you know, confident <laughs> that their particular version of how things fit together has got to be right. Uh, and that's where I get more skeptical. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly if it comes out a certain way that you already believe it's like, that's a little too convenient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, in a way that adds a layer of suspiciousness to it. Cause you think, okay, well, was this all just constructed post hoc to get what you wanted? Yeah. This was on the other hand, conforming to your previous ideas and conforming to your cultural and commonsensical conceptions is a, a, a kind of intellectual virtue. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's kind of maybe kind of mixed in a way. Well, isn't that the, uh, what's that called the, 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 the Genetics are no the you know the origins of the idea the fallacy. genetic fallacy the genetic fallacy right yeah you, you still may be right even if you were biased in how you came to your ideas um, yes right um, but again uh, you you know it's it's like the common sense philosophy you talk about in the book I forget what that's called common sense philosophy or something yeah you know, like you know are we living in a simulation look out the window <laughs> is that what it looks <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. I mean, I'm tempted to the Wittgensteinian response, right? Well, well what, what would it would look, look like, like if we yeah. were in some <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. at the same time, right, I think there's I think there's something to be said for common sense, right? So so there's an ambivalence in the in my thinking and in the book about common sense. And you know, on the one hand, I think common sense cannot be thoroughly correct because there are no viable views left in cosmology that respect every dimension of common sense. And mm -hmm. I would talk about this in various ways, but you know, the easiest, quickest way to get to it is, is quantum mechanics. And so common sense cannot be thoroughly correct. So you can't just dismiss something based on common sense. On the other hand, we don't really have any better tools than common sense for figuring these things out. So we kind of have to rely to some extent on common sense despite its imperfection, right? Because, so, I mean, the other kinds of tools we have would be science, right? And we're, but when we're talking about the kinds of issues where scientific testing does not yield decisive results, right? There's no, as we're talking about with Chalmers, right? There's no decisive scientific test that we're living in a simulation, right? There's no decisive scientific test about, you know, the origin of the universe, at least not yet. I mean, maybe eventually, mm -hmm. right? But you can't just poke, point your science at it and say, ah, yeah, you can ignore common sense because science will just tell you the answer. Right. For some things you can't, right? But not for the kinds of questions that we're talking about. 
Yeah. And then the other kind of tool you have is something like simplicity, theoretical elegance, fruitfulness, right? Those kinds of abstract theoretical virtues, right? And again, those are kind of indecisive because lots of these views have their kind of attractiveness and elegance theoretically. Um, so, so what we're left with is lots of not very good ways of peering into that dark ring around the brightness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And common sense is one of those ways, right? So to the extent something violates common sense, I think there is, unless we have a really compelling reason to think otherwise, I think that is a strike against it. Yeah. Uh, just not a decisive strike. It's not three strikes and you're out. It's just like the first strike. Well, along the lines of what Tipler was talking about, um, you know, I was thinking about if we did encounter a uh, extremely advanced extraterrestrial intelligence capable of genetic engineering and creating life forms and, and planetary engineering, you know, like uh, geoforming, you know, turning Mars into earth. And, you know, we're already thinking about doing all this stuff and, right. uh, you know, give us another 5,000 years or 50,000 years or 500,000 years of Moore's law applied, you know, what would be able to do. And then you show up, you know, an ancient human that kept capacity to do this. That looks like a deity. So, yeah. and the chances of us finding an extraterrestrial any anywhere remotely uh, at our level, culturally and technologically, is close to zero. They're going to be way ahead of us or way behind us. They won't be way behind us because we won't even find them. So, if we do encounter them, they're going to be way ahead of us, and that would look like God. So, is that what you're talking about? And of course, when I bring this up with Christians, they go, "No, that's not what we're talking about. We mean a supernatural being." Is like, but how would right. you know it was supernatural and not just really, really advanced? Right. <laughs> Or if we, if we live in a simulation, then there may be some player running the simulation who has the power to start it, stop it, run duplicates, make miracles. This player would not exist in our spatiotemporal manifold. They'd be outside of it in a certain sense. They wouldn't be subject to our laws of physics. They'd have a different laws governing them. It kind of sounds like a deity. But it could mm -hmm. just be like some 16-year-old kid. <laughs> right. <That's laughs> right? So right. relative to their world, they might be right. very mundane. But relative mm -hmm. to our world, they'd have miraculous powers and trans be the cause of our universe and transcend space and time, right? So, you know, if that's what all you need to be a deity, then, you know, then we should call this, you know, sadistic adolescent running our world <laughs> God. <laughs> Okay, another weirdness in, in your book is consciousness, and uh, th this comes up a lot on the yeah. show. There's a, I get a lot of books about it. It is, a, it is an interesting problem. So distinguish for us the easy problem of consciousness and the hard problem of consciousness. What are we talking about here? Right. So, yeah, this is a distinction uh, that David Chalmers uh, either invented or popularized uh, between problems that are easier, but not necessarily really easy, <laughs> like you know, what kind of brain states are correlated with having your eyes open and seeing red? And what he calls the hard problem, which is, why is there consciousness at all in a brain? And it's that problem that philosophers really struggle with, as well as consciousness scientists of various sorts from various backgrounds, right? What do you need to add to the physical, material, biological world in order to have a being that has experiences like we do. Thomas Nagel's phrase is, if there's something it's like to be a human, and there's nothing it's like, presumably, to be a stone. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the relevant difference between us and stones? I mean, there are lots of candidates, <laughs> but we don't really know in virtue of what we have this experience, right? And some people have thought you need an immaterial soul, right? That's the standard substance dualist view, right? You got a soul, a rock doesn't have a soul, that explains it, right? But the kind of the majority view among scientists these days is more materialist, right? There's, it's something biological about us or something about our informational structure or something like that. Uh, and then the question is, okay, well, what's so great about having neurons like why neurons give rise to consciousness or what's so great about having certain kinds of informational structures why does that give rise to consciousness if if you put the same informational structures on a computer and a robot would the robot be conscious these are pretty tough questions 
And we're not going invent, to invent a consciousometer until we've settled these questions. <laughs> but we're nowhere near settling these questions. Yeah. Yeah, like with uh, data on Star Trek. Uh, you know, yeah. Letter Milana, he used to write for Star Trek. Uh, 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 two full seasons for the next generation. So he, he, when I asked him about data, he's like, well, really, uh, it's just an actor, of course. You know, and, and yeah. if he was really just a computer, he would just be sitting there. And you'd have to program into him, like when Captain Picard walks onto the bridge, you are to stand up, turn around, and greet him and say the following things. And we don't think of data doing that. We think of him as having volition of some kind. It's very natural in science fiction to read the entity, the robots that are portrayed or the space aliens that are portrayed as being conscious like us, right? Kind of like, especially when they have faces, <laughs> right? You just yeah. like, of course it's conscious like us, but, but, you know, from a consciousness science perspective, there would be a question of like, okay, well, maybe we need to know a little bit more about what's going on inside them to know whether they really would be conscious or not. What kind of system would data have to be to be really conscious? Now, some, some theories say, hey, look, if he acts as sophisticated, any entity that acts like data acts in Star Trek, Trek would necessarily be conscious, right? That is a legitimate view, and maybe that's the right view, but certainly not everybody thinks that, right? Lots of people think, no, you need specific kinds of biological structures or specific kinds of informational structures that might or might not be present in an entity that outwardly looks sophisticated. Right, so Searle's Chinese room is kind of one famous example of this, right? So he imagines a room where he, John Searle, who doesn't know any Chinese, is sitting with this giant rule book, right? And you put Chinese characters in on one end and he looks things up in the rule book and he puts Chinese characters out on the other end. And from the outside, it looks like Chinese conversation is going on. But as Searle says, look, there's nobody here who understands Chinese. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a very controversial thought experiment, but I think you could feel the pull of it mm -hmm. and say, okay, well, you know, maybe just talking as if you understand is not enough for really being conscious and having understanding. I guess this especially comes up with the large language models, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, people used to think the Turing test would be a great test for consciousness. If it talks like us, it must be conscious, right? And now we've got these machines that talk <laughs> a lot like us, but most mm -hmm. people are like, no, wait, you know what? They're not conscious. They're like, maybe yeah. the Turing test isn't a good test, or, or maybe yeah. you have to do it in a really specific, demanding way in order for it to be a good test, and the large language models don't quite pass. I mean, we, I mean, we don't know. I mean, I, I'm my view on all this is pretty skeptical. I think we there are a wide variety of possibilities and a wide variety of kind of justifiable theoretical views about this. And it's just kind of wide open what's going on with consciousness and under what conditions a computer or a space alien or a garden snail would be conscious. Yeah. Yes. It seems to me this could be one of these unknowable problems because of our limitations of concept and language. You know, asking yeah. what's it like to be a bat or a dolphin or whatever. I can sort of imagine it, but if I really knew, I would just be a bat. I wouldn't be a human <laughs> asking what it's like to be a bat. I wouldn't even know yeah. I'm asking if I was really that. And this is the, um, you know, the philosophical zombie problem. What's it? How do I know that you're actually sentient? Maybe I'm the only one who's sentient in this conversation yeah. in, the world, in the world. And I don't think I could ever know what it's like to be you. Uh, I mean, I would just be you. <laughs> right and so i wonder yeah. you know, essentially you're like the easy problem is figuring out what the circuitry is doing the hard problem is asking what's it like to be the circuitry and it's like w yeah. what <laughs> i think the i would think the hard problem is the question of in virtue of what is there something it's like to be the circuitry what it's like to be you or what it's like to be me i think I would I would be reluctant to think of that as a as a yes no question we either know or we don't right it's like I suspect I know something about what it's like to be you mm -hmm. I think I know more about what it's like to be my wife <laughs> and I think I know less about what it's like to be a bat 
but maybe I know a little bit about what it's like to be a bat. I mean, there are skeptical possibilities, like maybe there's, maybe I'm the only conscious being in the universe and the rest of you are just, you know, kind of zombies. But um, I don't think there's much positive reason to accept that particular weird possibility. So if we kind of Yeah, I like that, that a lot. It's not an on and off switch. It's a rheostat. It's a yeah, little, it's a little bit more, a little so. bit less. And maybe consciousness and sentience is the same thing. Yeah. Your garden snail has a little bit compared to the dog. The dog has a little bit compared to the monkey and we have more and I don't know, the ant has less or something like that. That could totally be the case. Or it could be nothing. There's nothing it's like to be a garden snail. I mean, so I, I, I've talked with garden snail experts about this. I know quite a bit about the biology and behavior of garden snails. I've <laughs> got a whole chapter on this in the book and I'm a little bit of a <laughs> yeah. garden snail maniac. So yeah, I've talked with world leading researchers on garden snails, right? And one of them, said, oh yeah, they're just like these intricate little machines. I dissect them all the time. They're they're fascinating little machines. They're no more conscious than a tree is. Really? They're just like a moving huh. plant. <laughs> I would give it more than a tree. You know, if you're going to have uh, a scale, why not? Because it, it, it has how many neurons? Like 60,000 neurons? About 60,000 central yeah, nervous system Yeah, that's a lot. Neurons. That seems like a lot compared to, well, that's I don't a lot know, less than the an ant C, even. C. Elegans has 109 or whatever it is. 302. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, some people think, you know, I tilt toward thinking garden snails are conscious, but, but I, I wouldn't rule out the view that consciousness is a little more sophisticated than something a garden snail can achieve. Right. So there's this family of views in consciousness studies on which to be conscious, you really need to have some kind of self understanding of yourself as a conscious being. And kind of when you think about your own experiences, it seems kind of plausible to think that if I have a conscious experience of red, in some sense, I already grasp that I'm seeing red. I have a, there's a self understanding of yourself as a conscious being in every experience that you have. So these are um, higher, sometimes called higher order theories is, is one class of this type of view, right? So consciousness so is, involves So this would be something of, like the, like, sorry, like the mirror test, like I know that's me. So there's kind yeah. of a meta, another level above. There's a, like right, on these views, to be conscious, you really need to have some kind of way of thinking of yourself as a self, as a being with conscious experiences. So that seems to require some sort of theory of mind, some kind of understanding of the nature of minds and ability to apply that self-understanding to yourself. Yeah, see there, if it, that that's even... true, then probably it's going to be beyond garden snails, right? Yeah, way beyond. And even children don't get theory of mind until about age four, right? Uh, well, they have, so, I mean, some famous tests in theory of mind, they don't pass till age four, but there are other things where where they have, they seem to have other aspects of mental mm. understanding much earlier. Well, the chimp, um, the chimp passes the, the 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 mirror test, right? You put the red dot on the chimp's forehead, right. and you stick a mirror in front of him, and he pokes at it like oh, that's me, and there's right. something weird. But yeah, not right. many, right? The elephant with the white stripe down its side, or the dolphin apparently passes the mirror test. Maybe, you know, I'm, it's like <laughs> right. the mirror test itself is weird. I mean, it's kind of a quirky thing. We're trying to find out what's going on inside the head of this thing, right? <laughs> it's a wonderful test. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. exactly what it tests, right? But the idea that like something will look in a mirror and say, hey, what's that spot doing on my forehead? <laughs> that must be me. Yeah. And then touch their own forehead, right? That right. does, that's an interesting thing that not a lot of animals do. Um, and it seems to reveal something. What exactly reveals and how it's related to consciousness, I'm not sure. It would be a very demanding view of consciousness. So, you know, I put views of consciousness on a spectrum from abundant to sparse. Right, so the most abundant view of conscious, consciousness would be to say, literally everything in the world is conscious. So panpsychists hold this, right? So and a very make sparse view of consciousness would be to say something like, you really only have consciousness once you have sophisticated self-recognitional capacities, maybe like the kinds of capacities that the mirror test tests, right? And yeah. then you're not going to have consciousness, even in most vertebrates, you might not have consciousness in infants, Right, and that's a very a sparse view. Right mm -hmm. now, both 
panpsychism and extreme sparseness, they're pretty extreme views. I'm not going to put the bulk of my credence on either of those. It's probably somewhere in the middle. But the middle is huge. The middle is huge. So I think we don't really know whether, you know, where let's say like garden snails or bees or wherever. They're, they could be on one side of that line or they could be on the other side. And then when you say, you know, when we th- we're talking about the rheostat analogy, here's an interesting thing about light and rheostats. Even there's a, a difference between a light being on but dim and it's being off, right? Like either a photon is coming off of that yeah, thing yeah. or it's not. Yeah, there has it's to be a, a starting point somewhere. <laughs> there's a determinate fact. Conception. Right? <laughs> so, you know, another kind of possibility to consider is that there might not be a determinate fact about whether something's conscious. It might be less like the light is on but dim versus off. It could be something like there's no fact about where the boundary is between on and off, kind of like with yeah. a with a vague property like green. There's no determinate line exactly between green and blue. Maybe there's no determinate line exactly between being mm-hmm. conscious and not being conscious. Well, but the single cell following a chemical gradient in a liquid, because uh, it, there's more calories there and it just has a program to consume calories. You know that that's movement. It has goals. It's it hasn't. It looks like it has intention. Yeah. But it's, it, you know, if it's a single cell, it, it, it's not communicating with anything. Unless Doesn't you want to put seem... it in a colony of cells, and the colony itself is intelligent and sentient. Right. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a single cell would be conscious, right? People yeah. who would think that a single cell would be conscious would be on the, on the, the very abundant side of things, right? And, and maybe, maybe a, a moderate view is a little more plausible. Um, you know, but there are some attractions to the radically abundant views, uh, some kind of where life entails consciousness or, or even panpsychism. And do you make a distinction between consciousness and sentience? Um, there are various ways that distinction has been drawn. My favorite way to draw the distinction is to say that sentience is consciousness plus the ability to have positive or negative affective experience. Mm. So if you imagine a being with no emotion, no affect, no nothing is ever experienced as positive or negative, but still it can have conscious thoughts. That would be so this, this would be like Descartes' dog that you could kick because when it yelps, it's just a mechanical expression that it doesn't. Well, actually Descartes feel. would say the dog was not conscious, so it would be more like. <sighs> So Chalmers calls this uh, the, the Spock case, but that's an unfortunate name for it because as a Star Trek, tech, 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 Trek fan, I know that you know that Spock, in fact, does feel emotions. Right? Because he has half, let's he say, has a mom. He has a human mom. <laughs> let's say that you misunderstood Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and you thought that Spock had all kinds of rational thinking, but no capacity for emotion. He was never disappointed, never pleased, never afraid, never had any emotions. Then 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 Spock would be conscious, but not sentient. Yeah. Yeah, but see, uh, yeah, emotions, what are they? Well, they're kind of a proxy driver of behavior that you don't have to think about. So when I'm hungry, I don't do any calculations of calories or whatever. I, I just feel hungry. Or if I'm attracted to somebody, I just, you know, I don't pull out my waist to hip ratio calipers to do the measurements that evolutionary psychologists tell me you know, that men are interested in or vice versa with, you know, waist to hip uh, shoulder ratios in men or, or symmetrical faces or whatever. You don't have to do any of that. Natural selection did the calculations for us and all emotions are like that because who has time to do the c- computations in the real world? You just have to act quickly and that's what emotions. I think we, we distinguish emotions from reason uh, you know, kind of incorrectly that way. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Yeah, and I'm not sure that something like Spock, as we've just described him, is even conceivable, right? Because as soon as you start having practical action and goals, you probably have to have some kind of recognition of whether you're making progress to your goals or not. And that that has to be motivating to either change what you're doing or keep what you're doing. And maybe that's already, I'm not saying it for sure it is, but maybe that's already 
is efficient for the experience. It's uh, like uh, uh, Hume's famous experience. line about uh, uh, reason being the slave to the passions. Uh, re- what, what does he really mean by that? That, that? that reason can't tell you who you should be attracted to and you want to marry. But once you've decided that's the person that I want to marry, then you can do the calculations of what's the right. Point this person or whatever, something like that. Yeah. It doesn't tell you what goals you should have, but once you have goals, reason can help you get those goals. Right. Yeah. So that's a huge debate in philosophy about whether Hume is right about that or the kind of the famous advocate on the other side is Kant, who says that uh, reason does tell you what goals you should have, and in particular that you should have ethical goals. Mm. Yeah. But see, the single cell following a chemical gradient. It looks like it has a goal, but it's not reasoning its way toward that. That's just pure mechanics. So then it comes down to, well, how many neurons do you need? You know, but maybe three hundred two is not enough. Sixty thousand. We're getting there. You know, <laughs> maybe, one million, maybe. ten million, a hundred million, one billion, and maybe it's not the number of neurons. Maybe it's the neural networks and how they're structured. Um, yeah. You know, so then you get to these you know information theories about consciousness, where you have layers on top right. of layers on top of layers, or maps on top of maps. So my sense of self is just some net neural network in there that is kind of coordinating all the maps of my body, my arms and legs and my eyes and in, in, in information from my senses and all coordinated. And that's where the self is located. Something like, if that even exists. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a big class of theories that says that it's something like that going on. Yeah. Right. That you've got some sort of the consciousness means having some sort of self model. Uh, or that consciousness is some kind of arena in which uh, information from a variety of inputs kind of comes together for central processing. Let's see, I was just quoting from, um, again, researching my book here, at least 22 theories of consciousness as documented by Anil Seth and Tim Bain in their review article of the subject, including higher order theory, self-organizing meta-representational theory, global workspace theory, integrated information theory, information closure theory, dynamic core theory, neural Darwinism, predictive processing, neural representationalism, active inter- inference, attention schema theory, electromagnetic field theory, orchestrated objective reduction theory. <laughs> so yep. the fact, you know, if, if you went to the, you know, like what's the origins of the universe and there was like 22 different theories, the big bang was just one of 22 and it wasn't clear which one is the right one. You'd think, okay, these guys have a, a, some other kind of problem going on here. They're not even remotely close to figuring this out. Uh, that's what I think. I think we're pretty far from figuring it out. It could be that one of those theories is true or close to true. Um, but I just don't think we're in an epistemic position right now to say, oh yeah, that's the right one. Mm. What would it take to get there? I mean, uh, I, I see uh, Christoph Koch had to pay Chalmers um, <laughs> a, a, a case of wine for losing the 25-year bet that we'd have it solved by, the, this was last year. <laughs> yeah. Is it another 25 years or is it, it, it 2,500 years? Is it insoluble? <laughs> Maybe we need we, the, the next yeah. Einstein to go, no, no, you're, you're looking right. at this completely wrong. If we knew what it would take, we would yeah, already be We there. would do it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so <laughs> we don't know what it would take. I My guess is 25 years is not soon enough. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to be thrown into a whole new crisis about this by AI systems, right? So right mm-hmm. now there's a lot of debate about, okay, what animals are conscious or what features of human psychology are responsible for us being conscious. Those are two very difficult questions. Mm-hmm. But, you know, another thing that's going to happen is we're probably soon going to be making AI systems that some theories of consciousness would say, oh, this has got what it takes to be conscious. And other mm. theories will say, no, this doesn't have what it takes. And there will be ordinary users of AI systems who've downloaded AI companions onto their phones or whatever, who who think those companions really have experiences and they fall in love with them. And there'll be other people who are like, no, you need a soul. You know, no machine could be conscious, you know. And so there's, I think there's going to be massive theoretical and popular dispute about highly sophisticated AI systems and their consciousness. And that's that's just going to add a whole orthogonal layer of confusion and difficulty <laughs> to this problem that we've only started to appreciate. <laughs> Are you worried about AI as an existential threat? Not in the Terminator sense, but in the 
uh, you know, it doesn't even care about us. It's going to be infinitely smarter than us, and it'll just, you know, wipe us out because it doesn't doesn't need us. I am inclined to think that there is a small chance of that, but small chances about things that are so catastrophic deserve to be treated seriously. Mm-hmm. There's a bolide out there somewhere, so we should be looking for it, so we don't go the way of the dinosaurs. You mean like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were talking about the Fermi paradox right why is there nobody out there i guess my inclination to think is to think that the simplest answer to the well maybe not the simplest but my inclination to think that the fermi paradox we should think about it seriously in terms of the tendency of technological civilizations to extinguish themselves Hmm. you know just kind of considering it fairly abstractly as technological civilizations advance in technology, they gain increasing power over their environments, which is going to include, that will almost always be a double-edged sword. It's going to include the power to achieve great things, but also the power to wreak great destruction. Right. And habitable environments are small and fragile, right? So if we humans keep developing technological power, uh, you know, that power gets more, uh, gets stronger and stronger relative to our little habitat Earth here. Mm. Um, you know, we have greater and greater risk of of extinguishing ourselves. And optimists are maybe a little too optimistic about what would be take what it would take to really have a self sustaining environment on Mars or something like that. Right? Mm-hmm. So. So I don't know what, how we were somehow somehow we triggered by pessimism about this. All right, the AI. Thing, oh well, right? they so, were talking about the well L the L and the Drake equation, lifetime of civilization. Yeah, right. It, it may it may not be as long as the opposite. It might be short, and that would explain the Fermi paradox. And you know, so there's this concern about AI as a source of human extinction or existential risk. I'm inclined to think maybe. But maybe we don't even know yet what the technology is that is the riskiest that's going to extinguish us. But in general, as technology advances, risk to humanity probably continues to increase. Mm-hmm. I'd be more worried about nuclear weapons. In any case, the use of AI uh, that caused problems is a human problem, not the AI problem. I see it. Terror, you know, terrorists using AI. Uh, to do things. The problem is the terrorists, <laughs> not the AI. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> or both, yeah. Yeah, my answer yeah. to the Fermi Paradox is that they, they, they probably are out there. There's probably not as many of them as we, uh, yeah. the optimists think. And it's mostly just empty space. The chances of them getting here is just next to nil. It's just, you know, just, right. just vast. They're probably yeah. in some other galaxy or something and they can never get here. I think a good answer to the Fermi, Fermi Paradox is probably going to appeal to multiple features, right? One would be relatively short civilizations, you know, maybe on average on the whole. Also, you know, the great filter is behind us, right? That it's, you know, kind of relatively rare to have the right kind of system to give rise to intelligence. And then also, you know, it might be a little harder to see intelligences than you might think. And we haven't really looked that hard at uh stars that are far away you know so mm-hmm. so some combination of those things it does seem to I me mean, pretty unlikely that there's no other intelligent life anywhere in the entire universe that would be kind of astonishing it would be astonishing given the numbers that now that we know that right. pretty much every star in the sky has planets every galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars so there's trillions of planets i mean no matter how low the filter is in the drake equation uh, you know, there's going to be some out there, but again, they're probably just, uh, far, far away. And also you could get all the way up to the point of Neanderthal intelligence right. and we wouldn't know that they're there because they're right. not making technologies that we can detect. Or even our current technology. I mean, sure. We're emitting some radio waves, but you no, know, we're not going to detect a planet like that in Andromeda, right? If you no. some stray radio waves coming off of it. So, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, yeah, the really super visible ones would have to be massively you know they'd have to be taking entire stars and blowing them up and stuff like that for us to see them and you know that level of technology might not be very stable or very common yeah right a dyson sphere techno signatures i like that 
Although yeah. Avi Loeb points out that any chemical rocket, other than going to, say, Andromeda, which is coming toward us, you can never get to any other galaxy because they're, they're expanding away from us faster than any chemical rocket could ever go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we won't get there. <laughs> I don't think, not in our lifetime. <laughs> but, you know, get back to the consciousness. There's something about um, quantum physics that's spooky and weird, since the title of your book. And there's something about consciousness that's spooky and weird. And I, so I've got to notice this tendency, particularly among New Agers. There's got to be some connection there. Maybe quantum physics or the quantum field has something to do with consciousness. And I don't know. What do you make of all that? Um, that's possible. Uh, I think um, the kind of weirdness that we see with quantum physics is not quite the same kind of weirdnesses that we see with consciousness. I mean, mm. just the two-slit experiment, for example, and other kinds of quantum puzzles, uh, like the Bell equations, is that's a really different kind of strangeness and violation mm. of common sense than what we see with questions about whether snails are conscious or mm. whether they're immaterial souls. So in a way, it would be kind of convenient if those two things could be answered in one fell swoop. Um, but I'm not particularly inclined to think that they have to be. Hmm. All right, I'm going to read you a quote from Deepak Chopra's book, You Are the Universe. <laughs> Consciousness is fundamental and without cause. It is the ground state of existence. As conscious beings, humans cannot experience, measure, or conceive of reality devoid of consciousness. So this would be, what, the consciousness first, or kind of a consciousness monism, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean... That's a kind of idealism. Mm. Maybe it's true. I mean, the argu if the argument is we cannot conceive of something without consciousness, I think that's not a very good argument. Mm. Right? We can't consciously conceive of something without consciously conceiving of it. Yes, Correct. It's kind of but that's trivial. So that doesn't show anything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that we could conceive of a system that lacks consciousness... That seems like also trivially true. So, um, so I kind of inclined to think that a quick argument that we can't conceive of something without consciousness it, it depends upon a kind of equivocation. Uh, now, maybe I haven't read a lot of Chopra. I read some in college, and <laughs> uh, I haven't read since. But you know, so maybe there's, I assume, hopefully, there's more there uh, than that. But. Uh, well, in general, reflecting... right? Again, I just I'm I'm not tend to be convinced by these philosophical arguments, right? One of the things that you see over and over again in the history of philosophy, right? There's this argument arguments for idealism, arguments for dualism, mm. arguments for various forms of materialism, and philosophers have pretty sounding arguments where the premises you can kind of feel the pull of them, but they point in all mm -hmm. kinds of different directions, and I just generally don't find them convincing in the same way that a really good tightly done scientific experiment is convincing. Yeah. Well, so like Deepak says, um, you know, that like when I said, well, where, where does at Millie's mind go when her brain dies of Alzheimer's? He's like, yeah. well, it, it returns to the place where it was before. He's like, well, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, so his argument is something you've heard this before. Like the, the brain is like a radio receiver. You still need the radio yeah. to detect the signals coming in. But to that, I always ask, well, where's the, the, you know, the radio station? You know, I can go to the radio station to see where the signals are coming. Yes, I still need the radio in my office to get it. Uh, where's the equivalent of that in the universe or the cosmos or whatever of consciousness? If, it, if the yeah. field is out there and being generated and the brain is needed to pick it up, something like that. I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, yeah, you know, yeah. my... I, I I think it's reasonable to have doubt among all of these types of theories and distribute your credences not very confidently. But, you know, if you're going to, for me, the most natural, simplest, most attractive theory is kind of just boring scientific naturalism of some sort, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I think you need a little something more than we have as evidence to get beyond that with any confidence. So there's a kind of, I think yeah. there's kind of a, there's a 
I think, kind of a, an attractiveness to defaulting to, well, it kind of looks like there's just material stuff and we're just naturally evolved beings and there's nothing kind of natural or non-material behind it. I mean, maybe there is. I guess maybe because it feels like it. I mean, I feel like I have thoughts yeah. floating around in my head. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I mean, I think maybe the strongest argument against materialism is to say, yeah, there's something it's like, you have a feeling, and it's really hard to imagine how that could arise out of just purely material processes. Yeah. It's really hard to conceive of that. And I, I, I feel the pull of that. I think, I think it is hard to conceive of it. And that is a reason to think maybe it's not true. Um, but maybe <laughs> it's just a, it's a problem with our conceptual abilities that we have trouble. Yeah, with. I think so. I mean, I think intuitively we are dualists. That's what it feels like. Yeah. You know, and, you know, Paul Bloom points this out that, you know, we, we can watch a movie like uh, Freaky Friday where Jamie Lee Curtis and, and, and uh, Lin Lindsay Lohan switch bodies. It's like, well, wait a minute. What, what's switching? <laughs> There's no, <you> know. <laughs> right. Uh, but we get it, you know, or, or, um, yeah. um, the, the Steve Martin and Lily Tomlin, where they switch bodies and the, the guy knows what it's like to be a woman and the and vice versa and hilarity ensues, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, right. You know, there's and something so, very intuitive about this idea that we aren't merely material things that something yeah. in us, you know, could switch bodies or could continue into an afterlife. Um, and they're attractive philosophical views that, kind of spell out a little bit at least how that could potentially work and try to insulate it in certain ways from the scientific evidence that you might think would suggest against it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But again, the, those the, out. the language and conceptual problems, you know, my mind, I always say it's my mind. Well, what, there's no mind. It's just your brain. The mind is just what the brain does. So, but, but, but you yeah. can't help but use the word. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, then you reify it into a thing and then, well, where does the mind go or the soul go uh, when you die? When the physical body dies, where does it go? And so one analogy is like, well, where does my heartbeat go when the heart stops beating when you're dead? It doesn't go anywhere. It's, there's no such thing. It's just a process. Right. And the process of mindness stops when the brain stops functioning. But, you know, that's, as you know, it's a pretty strong impulse to think, no, 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 it's got to continue. Somewhere, because I can't imagine not existing. You know, ask people, imagine yourself dead. You can't, you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see myself there in the casket, and all my loved ones are very sad, hopefully. <laughs> you, know, but, but you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be seeing anything. Right. I kind of like, you know, back in the late 19th, early 20th century, there, was, you know, there were psychical societies like mm -hmm. you know, that William James and others belonged to, and they were looking for real empirical evidence for yeah. immaterial souls. They were trying to like, okay, let's try a seance, see if it works. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's try... Papa Russell Wallace did that. He went right. to a bunch a of seances. a lot of very yeah. famous leading scholars did this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, they tried telepathy and stuff like that, and just over time, it kind of became pretty convincing that that stuff wasn't going on. Remember the so, McDougal experiments where he weighed the, the weight of a soul? Uh, you know, the body oh, dies yes, and right. then it, the it floats off idea. and it's, you know, one ounce lighter or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just measurement right. error. <laughs> yeah, that didn't stand up to scrutiny. Right, but that's <laughs> no. the kind of thing, right? So I kind of feel like if, you know, something like that could have panned out, and I like if a dualist is going to say, yeah, here's how we test it, or here's the empirical prediction, let's try it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I had this wonderful conversation with Pim von Lommel, who is a. Oh, yes, I know him. Yeah. Know him. Right. So I ran across him at a uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Tour to Science of Consciousness. And, you know, he's talking about near death experiences. That's what he's kind of famous for, right? And saying that he's a believer in them. I know. You know, and that there's <laughs> this autoscopic stage where you're above your body looking down at your body from above and then you kind of go toward a heaven or something like that. Right. And I'm like, Oh, well, if there's this autoscopic stage, you know, we could test that. Why don't you do something like take cards with green circles and red mm. squares and put them in positions that you couldn't see from the ground. But like if someone's floating above, they could look down. Right. So I said, well, you know, you're a scientist. And if you think this is going on and, and you see lots of near death experiences, cause you work in, 
emergency cardi cardiac surgery or something I think he was working on, right? Why don't you do this? And he's like, yes, I did exactly that. Right. So it was like, exactly. here's a dualist after my heart. Right. I'm like, yeah, right. great. So he testing it. Well, so how did the test come out? And he said, <laughs> well, what happened was, you know, so we actually had like these cards, I think it was cards facing up to just like virtually what I'd imagine facing up toward the sky or toward the ceiling. And he'd ask people and he said, people would say, what, there was some card up there? Of course, I wasn't paying attention to what was on the card. I was looking <laughs> at my body and the nurses and stuff like that. Right. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so he tried to test it, but he couldn't get the kinds of reports that he and I would have wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think like, yeah, if, 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 a, if substance dualism had that kind of empirical support, that would be really cool. But the mm -hmm. fact that so many people have tried in various ways and not found empirical support tends to tilt the evidence mm -hmm. against it in my view. I mean, that's not yeah. decisive. Again, it's a little bit like what I was saying with the simulation, right? It's not like, can kind of design it so that it's untestable, right? But you could also imagine tests and try tests. And as you see these tests not coming out in favor of simulation or immaterial souls, then maybe that should shift your a little away from that. Yeah. Well, yeah, one of those things I wrote about um, Temmel and some of the other ones was that experiment with the woman who, uh, the epileptic seizure woman where they're in there and they wake her up and then they tap around different parts of her brain with the electrode, and they're in the um, uh, the kind of um, temporal lobe fusiform gyrus area or something like that, where she starts floating out of her body. She's like, I'm up by the ceiling now, and they touch over here. Now my left arm is rising. My right arm is... Of course, she's just lying there, not moving at all. Yeah, yeah. And so I wrote about that and said, see, clearly the brain is the source of all this. There's no mind going anywhere. And I think it was von Pimmel who wrote me, goes, no, no, that's not our conclusion at all. And their their argument is something like again like the brain is you need the radio receptor but there's this other world out there. So yeah. like I've had these discussions with people that take ayahuasca. You know, most people that do it they really feel like there it, there's this it's opening the doors to this other world. Not everybody, but some of them, but but most of them do. And that, you know, when I ask, well what's the evidence for these spirit beings and the light beings or whatever that are in this other dimension? Well, take the ayahuasca and you'll see. That's the evidence. <laughs> It's like, yeah. well, but it's still in my head. How do I get out of my head? <laughs> right. And that yeah. seems, again, one of these insoluble problems. It's it's purely right. subjective. Yeah. So I'm, you know, kind of, I feel like the default should be, let's stick with kind of boring scientific naturalism until there's something enough mm. convincing on the other side. Yeah. But at the same time, I do think that since... Even scientific, even boring scientific naturalism turns out to be not so boring when you start looking at it and weird things that are being true about it. I think, you know, we can't just say, ah, oh, we've got it all figured out. Everything is kind of normal and understandable, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that is the case. So we should have an open mind mm -hmm. about these, maybe just call them non-default weird possibilities. Mm-hmm. Okay, last big subject as a professional philosopher along these lines as a naturalist. Free will and determinism and compatibilism. You know, if the universe is determined, which it is, we live in this materialist world, you are not making uh, volitional choices. All right, where are you on that and why? <laughs> I'm a kind of boring compatibilist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> my, uh, I, I, I basically agree with my colleague, John Martin Fisher. I think he's one of the, the, the best compatibilists out there right now, right? That... <sighs> You know, and this goes back to David Hume at least, right? Just the idea that, right, there probably isn't this kind of contracausal, supernatural will that some people might want, think there has to be in order for there to be real choice. But I don't think that's really what we need or want or should want for something worth being called choice and freedom, right? So more or less, as long as you are not constrained externally and acting according to your own authentic desires, that's enough to be acting freely. And you don't need a kind of like anything magical going on. There's no mini me in there. <laughs> There's no there mini was, me there, and you don't need there, one. <laughs> there'd be a mini mini me would have to have a mini mini me inside him <laughs> right 
<laughs> so I, I, it's kind of like a, defa- a deflationist view, right? So the idea mm-hmm. is you kind of people might have this inflated conception of of what it is to have a mind or what it is to be free, right? And deflationists will say, yeah, you don't need all that stuff for mentality and freedom. <laughs> Those things don't require for natural stuff, right? What we've got naturally is enough to be worth mm. calling a mind, be worth calling freedom, being worth worth calling choice. A lot of this seems to turn on this question of could you have done otherwise? And I guess it depends on what's the it here. Uh, you know, like if you rewound the tape and played it again, would you would you do the same thing? Well, you know, as Dennett points out with Gould's famous thought experiment on that for the history of life, yeah. if it's a read-only memory tape, then yeah, it's just a recording of what actually happened. <laughs> right. so there's no choice there. So this seems to then to, to turn on whether the universe is predetermined, yeah. you know, the block universe, because then you can't have real choice. It, you know, if, if the outside right. observer can just peek ahead at wh- what's going to happen, then it's already happened. Yeah, right. So I'm not, I don't support the idea that, that could have done otherwise is a good test of freedom. I think we can, mm. we can freely choose things, even if it's not the case that we could have done otherwise. Now, some people might say, okay, well, look, you know, that's not what I mean by the word freedom. So in some sense, this is, would be a semantic dispute. I mean, I do see it partly as a semantic dispute, right? Yeah. Some people will say, in order for there to be real freedom or real choice, you need to meet this high condition of, like, could have done otherwise, and not just by chance, right? Not just quantum chance breaking a different way, but, like, in some more robust sense, it could have done otherwise. And you need to have something immaterial or kind of causal going on. And that, and or if you don't have that, you don't have freedom, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to define freedom in that kind of, I think, inflated way, then right, there's no freedom. But I'm like, that's not how I want to use the word freedom. Mm-hmm. So I think there's yeah, a perfectly it's... good philosophical sense of freedom in which it doesn't require that. And that's how I prefer to use the word freedom. And since the other kind doesn't exist, we kind of, we don't want to strip the word free out of our language. Because there is totally a difference between doing something freely and not. I mean, it's worth. There are some differences worth marking, <laughs> marking there, right? Yeah. The the, the, the could you have done otherwise? Uh, all of the things being equal, but all of the things are never going to be equal. The future is never going to be exactly like the past. So you find yourself in circumstances in which previously, when you were in similar circumstances, you went X. And that didn't turn out well. And right. you can learn from that. So you think, well, because last time I did this thing and I'm not going to do that again. Right. So, you, you know, you, there's kind of a self-determinism based on the past, which is not going to be exactly like the future. Uh, yeah, that's true. And when you use a phrase like, could it have gone otherwise? That is a, a claim uh, about a counterfactual. And when you make counterfactual claims, they're always going to be relativized to a set of facts that you're holding constant and a set of facts that you kind of let vary. So Mm. when you say, oh, this could have gone this other way, that statement is always implicitly relative to given such and such facts as a constant. So questions like that turn out to be highly contingent, or answers to questions like that turn out to be highly contingent upon what you take as the thing you're holding constant when you're thinking about how things could have gone otherwise. Right? So mm-hmm. I could have gone to the Chinese place instead of the Mexican place for lunch, holding constant kind of certain number of things, but holding constant my desire this morning to have Mexican food instead of Chinese food, then I wouldn't or couldn't have done otherwise, right? So. So what you fix and what you allow to vary turns out to have a big effect on your evaluation of, of counterfactual statements like that. And I presume you make uh, as a compatibilist exceptions for brain tumors and extreme uh, drug addictions and brain damage and things like that. Right. So I think, I think well, one advantage of having a deflationary view of freedom is that you can say, okay, here is the sensible place to draw the line between what's done freely and what's done not, and it doesn't need to have any counter, counter-causal magical stuff going on. You can just say, well, look, you know, 
when done something because someone was pointing a gun at you, mm. you didn't do it freely. You did it under duress, mm. right? And if in an epileptic seizure, someone's hand slaps me in the face, they didn't freely choose to slap me in the face. And that's very different than if they weren't having a seizure and they just <laughs> slapped me, right? So we can mark that important difference. And we don't need to do any, you know, difficult metaphysics to figure out what's going on there uh, between the free cases and the unfree cases. How come I have so many books in my office on free will and determinism from the last couple of years? <laughs> what is the fascination with this? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, it's a, certainly an interesting topic. Is it because of the implications for the criminal justice system and holding people accountable and, and the implications of where you stand on that issue? Uh, yeah, that certainly could be. I mean, some of the people who have been arguing against freedom in philosophy called hard determinists sometimes, right? Say, well, look, um, one advantage of being a hard determinist, they see it as an advantage, is that no one is really ultimately responsible for what they did, right? It was always caused by some combination of past circumstances uh, and their biology. Um, and that suggests a certain kind of merciful attitude mm -hmm. toward people for their wrongs and a view of the criminal justice system is really not about, you know, punishing the bad guys, but rather kind of focusing on helping people get on the right track as much as possible and dis disincentivizing people from, from doing bad things. Um, and if that's an appealing vision of justice, then you know, that would be one advantage of being a hard determinist. Yeah, I do think it turns on that a lot. I just had Sapolsky on the show. He wrote, uh, his new book is called Determined. And, you know, it's 600 yeah. pages long, and, you know, like 1,200 references and, you know, every study ever done on every physiological and neurological and hormonal and upbringing and this and that you can possibly imagine. Yeah. But, you know, in the opening pages, he talks about, you know, he's a professor at um, Stanford. He talks about being at the Stanford graduation and you know, there's all these super elite successful people there. And in the background, there's this gardener who's picking up leaves and, and Robert says, how come that guy is not a Stanford graduate? And then, you know, the next hundred pages, well, because you know, maybe his mom had this in a room in, in the second term, in the second trimester, she smoked or she did, and this caused this to happen and that to happen and so on and so on and so on. And, you know, like 25 years later, he's a gardener instead of a Stanford. You know, that's the kind of the key to his book. He feels, right. in a way, sort of feels bad. Like all these, these Stanford graduates, like congratulating themselves. Look what I did. It's like, you really didn't do what you think you did. Because you, you could have been the gardener guy. Had it not I just gone... don't think that follows. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think this, the compatibilist, you might be interested to see John Martin Fisher wrote a review of Sapolsky. Oh, Sapolsky I haven't seen that. So, um, you know, I think the compatibilists are not going to deny really any of the facts that Sapolsky is pointing to. What they're going to deny is that a lack of freedom and a lack of responsibility follows from that fact. Mm. And they're going to deny it by using words in a different way. You know, so this is why I think it's a semantic issue. They're going to say, well, look, Sapolsky has an inflated conception of what it takes to be free and an inflated conception of what it takes to be responsible and is saying, oh, in some ultimate sense, it must be the case that you could have done otherwise in order to be free and responsible, right? So, but that's not the way that we should conceptualize freedom and responsibility. We should conceptualize it in a more minimalistic, naturalistic way where all of those facts are compatible with being free and responsible. And there's a difference between someone really choosing to go to college and someone being coerced into going to college because their mm. parents say, if you don't go to college, blah, 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 blah. Right. And we can use the word free to mark that distinction. Mm. Right. And you say, well, you know, in this case, the person freely chose to go to college and so they're responsible for that decision. In the other case, the person didn't really choose freely. And it's really more their parents that are responsible for the decision to go to college. Right. And that is a perfectly sensible, useful 
way to use words like free and responsible, you know, that doesn't require any kind of advanced metaphysical nonsense. I shouldn't say nonsense. Yeah, right? yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't require the extra stuff that mm-hmm. that a lot of the uh the people like Sapolsky kind of think might be necessary for free. Yeah. I do think a lot of it is is um motivated by the consequences of what the belief system is again criminal justice i mean he goes on and on about how unfair yeah. it is yeah it, it there are a lot of injustices in the criminal justice system. right but it, that, that that to me they don't That's turn an attractive on this view, issue but you could you could still have that normative view without the metaphysics yeah you can still think that the function of the criminal justice system should be reform and that we should be sympathetically understanding and merciful to people who do things that we perceive as wrong. Yeah. You can still accept all that without, without the, um, the metaphysical anti freedom. Yeah. And I think it, it, it helps to uh, have that, um, spectrum of sentience and awareness and so on because they hard determinists make the, the analogy of like in the middle ages, when somebody, you know, killed somebody with an axe, they punished the axe along with the, the guy who did it, right? It's like, yeah. okay. and, and so, you know, people like Sapolsky say, you know, when you're punishing a criminal and, you know, executing him or whatever, it's the same as punishing the axe. And to me, it's not, you know, because there, there's, there's degrees yeah, of freedom. that's not there. really fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's not really a fair analogy to the, to the compatibilist, I think. Yeah. All right, Eric, we're coming up on two hours. We've covered pretty yeah. much every major topic there is. This is so <laughs> it's interesting. It's been fun chatting with you. <laughs> uh, how do you top that? The, the weirdness of the world. You've just covered pretty much all the great weird uh, problems we face. What's yeah. uh, next on your uh, research and writing agenda? Uh, well, I'm, I'm debating between writing as my next book something about ethical reflection and ethical behavior, pulling on the stuff we were talking about with ethicists. Oh, nice. yeah. And this idea that we aim, in my view, that we aim for moral mediocrity, that we aim to be about as morally good as our peers. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the other thing that I'm debating about as my other possible second next book is uh, what it is to believe something. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I defend this view that believing is really more about walking the walk and living your life in a certain way than it is about saying certain things with the feeling of being sincere. Right. So a good test case of this would be something like believe that all the races are intellectually equal. Mm. It's kind of easy to say that and to feel Mm -hmm. sincere when you say that. But unless you actually kind of live that way, I don't think you really believe it. Right. Or Mm. someone who says they believe in God. But like you look at their life and it's not mm. deemed to be compatible with that, right? They're not mm. walking the walk. So yeah, so that kind of walk the walk picture of belief. I've been uh, interested in that for a long time, but more recently, the you know January sixth um, insurrectionists. Did they really believe that the election was stolen and that's why they were yeah. there? How many of there are there just kind of tribally, like oh yeah, the, the boss said to come down there going to be big fun we're going to raise some hell but yeah. know, they don't really know you know like or the other example i use is yeah you know the pizza gate thing you know it was hillary really running a pedophile ring out of a pizzeria right. well one guy definitely believed it edgar welch he went there with his gun to <laughs> but, you know, that's walking the but, walk <laughs> but, but, but you know most people when they tell the posters yeah, yeah i think there might be something to it and it's some high yeah. you know it's like did they really believe that or are they just right. is that kind of a tribal belief like yeah i don't i don't like democrats whether that one's real or not, yeah. I don't know. But that's the kind of thing Hillary would do. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think there are these cases where it's not quite right to say the person believes it and not quite right to say the person fails to believe it. Instead, they're kind of splintered. They kind of like part of them walks that way and then part of them's like, no, that's not right. Right. And it doesn't have to be like a stored sentence in the head that either is Pizzagate is true or Pizzagate is false, like there in yeah. you know the belief yeah. box or whatever. And it can there can people often I think have kind of confused dispositional profiles. So like in a certain situation they're going to go one way, in a different situation they're going to go another, and it's not totally coherent. And I think our understanding of belief should be made to handle those cases smoothly without kind of needing to 
think that there's like really the underneath that the real st- one stored thing that they either believe or don't believe. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I've been thinking about those different kinds of truths again, like religious truths versus scientific truths. You know. To, yeah. You know. To, Do you know Neil that... Van Leeuwen's work on this? He's got this really interesting book just came out about all. No, this. what is that? Tell me. Um, what's the book ne- called? What's he called? Um, Neil. Neil Van Leeuwen. V A N space L E U W E N. And I can send you a link later, and you can yes, share no, it with your I, listeners I if you think, want. I think I have seen some references. Yeah, he distinguishes yeah. between um, what he calls religious credences and mundane beliefs, oh, or, or what right. he sometimes calls group, groupish beliefs and mundane beliefs, and he thinks that they're just very different states with very different functional profiles. And when someone says, oh, I, I believe the God is a trinity, that's mm. a very different cognitive state when they say, oh, I believe the light switch is on the left wall. <laughs> Yes, right, right. Yeah, so he's got a really nice, he's done a series of papers on this, and he's got this this book that's all oh, about good. that. Oh, good, I'm going gonna, like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look that up and add that. Yeah, because I've been thinking about that in terms of, like, Jordan Peterson's, you know, mythic truths, you know, the resurrection. You know, was there a man really named Jesus? Was he really crucified? Did he really rise from the dead three days later? Now, a lot of Christians will be, yeah, I have to believe that, because that's what Paul said. Paul said, if you don't believe the resurrection happened, then you shouldn't be a Christian. But a lot of others, I think, you know, how would they ever know you know, they don't really know the arguments, you know, for and against and all that stuff. It's just, yeah, that's just, I'm a Catholic. That's what I believe, you know. And yeah. whether they think about it or not is kind of irrelevant. Yeah, so Van Leeuwen thinks it's really playing a different kind of functional role, a cognitive role in their lives than, you know, ordinary day-to-day beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, I've told that story too many times in this podcast, but I'll repeat it again. We're at that conference with Richard Dawkins and, uh, Ken Miller, who's a a, a great uh, bi- biologist who debunked the intelligent design creationism, because he does cell biology, all that business about the bacterial flagellum and all that stuff. Yeah. And but so and he wrote a whole book about this in the last chapter. He says, "By the way, I'm a Catholic, and I you know I believe in Jesus and God, the whole thing." You know, so we're at this conference, and Richard's you know uh, really pushing him on this, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So he's like. All right, Ken, let's say we found a piece of the true cross. And on the piece of the true cross is a little bit of flesh. We could extract the DNA from Jesus himself, you know, <laughs> the divine conception, the nice. whole thing. And, and he could see where this was going. So, you know, Ken goes, Richard, Richard, I- I'm not saying any of this is true. Th- this is just, I'm a Catholic. This is what we believe. He's like, what? Well, but, oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a conversation yeah. stopper. Like this is a different, a different realm than my science. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's an interesting kind of view. Yeah. I have a, uh, yeah. There are various philosophers of religion who have views, who have views like that and celebrate kind of religion in that spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. All right. That's good, Eric. We just hit, hit the two hour mark. So yeah, okay. <laughs> we're good. Good talking to you. <laughs>